afternoon. Hello, I'm Anna Rodriguez, C's classes of 1986 and 1988, and co-chair of the She Opened the Door 2020 event. For those who don't know, the She Opened the Door name refers to Winifred Edgerton Merrill, the first woman to earn a Columbia degree. We'll see Winifred is standing up here on, in the portrait on, our, on the stage as well. Um, I hope uh, you enjoyed the, the morning so far. Uh, with uh, this ama the amazing keynote this morning and the uh, breakout sessions uh, were truly inspiring. I'm now pleased to introduce Lisa Carnoy, co-chair of the Columbia Board of Trustees and 1989 Columbia College alumna, who will introduce our next keynotes. Good afternoon, thank you, Anna, and I want to congratulate you and the entire committee's leadership in making this such a tremendous success. Like all of you, I was asked to think about who opened the door for me. Well, there are many people, including several amazing women in the room today, but I would like to recognize Gigi Michelson. Many people ask me if I'm the first woman to chair the Columbia University Board. In fact, it was Gigi back in the late 1980s. Gigi was a graduate of our law school a dozen years before Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And like RBG, she could not get a job at a corporate law firm. So she went off to an industry with a lot of women, retail, and joined the executive training program at Macy's. She rose through the ranks there, as well as serving on the boards of Quaker Oats, General Electric, Goodyear, and the Federal Reserve. Importantly, for many of us, she advocated for co-education at Columbia College as a trustee. That vote was in 1983, and Gigi ascended to chair the year I graduated in 1989. And as chair of the Columbia Board, she was known for her intelligence, her commitment, her savvy, and her grace. I would also like to take this opportunity to share a few of the priorities facing today's board. Manhattanville, leadership, and the fourth purpose. So just 10 blocks north of here in Manhattanville in West Harlem, we are embarking on the first major new urban campus in over a century. So why is this so important? To advance knowledge, to advance Columbia, we simply need more space. Space to do research in neuroscience, which is our first building in Manhattanville, space for performance and visual arts, the second building, and it was deliberate to put the scientists next to the artist, space to convene conferences and for our business school and for our engineering students, 17 acres, which coincidentally is the same as the Morningside campus, and exquisitely beautiful. Our two newest buildings currently under construction are designed by Liz Diller and will open for our new business school in about a year and a half but also a radically new kind of urban campus. There are no gates, no walls. It is totally open with deliberate programming on the first floor of every building to welcome our neighbors from a climbing wall to a food court and weekend education, cultural, and healthcare programming. In addition to space, we need leadership. As you can imagine, this is a critical and enduring focus for the trustees the next generation of leadership. Some of you attended the leadership panel this morning, as did I, and you would have heard from my friend, Esther Stetcher. She is our vice chair emeritus and someone who definitely opened a door for me. Approximately six or seven years ago, President Bollinger asked the two of us to do a deep dive in the pipeline of women in leadership roles in the university. What can we learn from other institutions, academic and other? What can we do to attract develop, and retain the very best at Columbia. Now I see several here today. I see Amelia Alverson, who leads our alumni affairs and development, or what I like to call the billion dollar woman. I see Donna McPhee, who would be known to all of you as the president of the CAA and the head of alumni affairs. I see my dear friend, Lisa Rosen Metch, a Columbia grad and scholar in public health and now dean of general studies. But amazingly, Fully half of our academic deans are women. In addition to general studies, architecture, planning, and preservation, Amal Andros, arts, Carol Becker, engineering, who you saw this morning with Mary Boyce, 
Law, Jillian Lester. The Mailman School of Public Health, Linda Freed. Nursing, Lorraine Frazier. SIPA, Marigiano. And our newest, social work, Melissa Begg. And of course, arts and sciences, Amy Hungerford. And let's not forget Barnard's amazing president, Sian Bailak. Actually, it's more than half, and I hope the next time we convene, I need to go from my hands to my toes. So part of the reason we need such excellent leadership at our university is because we have incredibly bold goals. President Bollinger continues to raise the bar for us. He has a vision and he has the stamina to strive for excellence in all things. And one of the areas that especially inspires me is what he calls the fourth purpose a view that universities are uniquely positioned to bring people together to solve our biggest challenges, including climate. You may have seen the announcement last week sharing some of the findings of our Climate Change Task Force led by Sir Alex Halliday and announcing several efforts to address the climate crisis, including the formation of a new school. We are already a leader in climate science through Lamont Doherty, the Earth Institute, and several other areas of the university. But a school will allow us to expand our research, engage with students, and extend our practical engagement in the world. As President Bollinger said, there is much work for us all to do. We know the stakes are high for the university and the world. It is my pledge that we, the Columbia community, will meet our responsibility to act. So you see that this is an, a tremendously exciting time at Columbia. So speaking of tackling really tough challenges in the world and our city and state, we are pleased today to be joined by Letitia James, the 67th Attorney General for the state of New York. She is the first woman of color to hold statewide office in New York and the first woman to be elected attorney general for the state of New York. You can read her full bio in your app, but her success in public life includes passing the Safe Housing Act, which forced landlords to improve living conditions in New York City, and serving as an advocate for the city's most vulnerable communities in New York City, as New York City's public advocate. As a woman, I love that Letitia brought us the groundbreaking law that banned questions about salary history from the employment process to address the gender wage gap. As a New Yorker, I love that she is such a powerful advocate for change. And of course, she is one of our own, as she studied at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. Please join me in welcoming Letitia James. Hello, everybody. Oh, you can do better than that. Hello, everyone. We're ladies. Come on. Hello, everyone. I want to thank Lisa for that kind introduction and for uh, all that she does to support the great work of this great school. And I'd also like to acknowledge my good friend and your fellow trustee who is here today, Julie Menon, for all that she is doing. Julie and I have worked together for many years and I am so grateful that she continues her work in public service, serving as the director of, of the census for New York City. I know that she will work tirelessly to ensure that all New Yorkers are accurately counted and given the recognition they deserve by the federal government. You see, everyone matters and therefore everyone counts. And it's really critically important that as we leave here that we reach out to countless number of individuals who right now are hiding in the shadow of government individuals who are vulnerable and marginalized, individuals who believe that people in government right now are the enemy. And it's important that we extend a hand and let them know that that, can be not, that is not the case at all, and that they too matter, and that they too should be counted, and that they too are part of the human family. I also like to thank Anna Rodriguez. Yes, that one table. <laughs> So I know who to look at when I need applause. That's my amen table. I'd also, I'm right now I'd like to thank Anna Rodriguez for co-chairing today's event. And I must admit, I am starstruck at this moment.
because I love, like you love, Christiane Amanpour. I adore her. She's amazing. I am a fan, and I adore her, and I watch her. And I, it's, it's so critically important that at this point in time um, that the journalists not be censured, journalists speak truth to power, journalists stand in the moment and tell us what is really happening in our government. I also want to recognize Poppy Harlow for all that she is doing as well. I want to thank you both. Yeah. I want to thank you both for your journalistic integrity and your commitment to telling the stories that matter. Even if some people, let me say that again, even if some people, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, um, even, at, even as some people may not want to hear them, we need to tell the truth. I also, again, yeah. I'm uh, honored to be here today to join so many distinguished uh, Columba, Colombian Columbi alumni. <laughs> That's a difficult one. It is a pleasure to be here on a campus that has furthered the careers and intellects of so many brilliant women. And it is truly gratifying to see that the university continues to walk the walk on diversity and inclusion. Many of Columbia's schools today are led by exceptional women, including Dean Jano Janow at SIPA. And yes, I did not graduate from SIPA. Um, I am about nine credits away from graduation. I was in SIPA when I got elected to office in city council a long time ago. And unfortunately, I need to come back and get my degree um, because I kept getting elected to different offices and that kept interrupting my coursework. <laughs> Dean Lester at Columbia Law. We want to congratulate him and of course, because we know that right now, the law is both a sword and a shield. And it's really critically important that we recognize the power of the law. I would not stand before you as the first woman of color elected in New York City and in New York State, but for the power of the law. And so we want to give a round of applause to Dean Lester at Columbia Law School. And Dean Boyce at the School of Engineering and Applied Science, because science is facts. <laughs> and climate change is real, even though some people don't want to believe it. And so we want to thank Dean Boyce for all that he is doing. So I stand here today, as we all stand here, because of the strong and intrepid and ambitious women who came before me. Women like Winifred Egerton, the first woman to receive a degree from Columbia, or Zora Neale Hurston, the first black woman to graduate from Barnard College, yes. <laughs> These women help all of us to realize that we too can achieve the dreams and goals, no matter what they may be. As a young girl growing up in Brooklyn in a family of eight, it was important for me to see other strong women as role models, because you cannot be if you cannot see. And it's important that individuals see what they would like to become. I often think of Shirley Chisholm, because she was a woman who hailed from Brooklyn. <laughs> the first black woman elected to the United States Congress who paved the way for me and many of my colleagues in public service. And times have changed dramatically since these women made their mark on history, or should I say, herstory. And yet, we must acknowledge that there is still work to be done. It remains critically important for more women to assume leadership positions, to speak up and to speak out, to demand their seat at the table. For these are challenging times in 2020. We are fighting a gender discrimination and we find ourselves in the midst of chaos and confusion, more divided now than we've ever been since the Civil War. And it's up to women, obviously, to change the course and the direction of our nation, to bring back dignity to our nation. That's why it's really important that all of you are here today. And so all of you have homework to do. 
You are having your lunch right now, but when you leave these doors, when you leave this university, all of you have got to go out and to make sure that you talk to others, individuals who may not think like you, who may even have a different political philosophy, who may even belong to a different party, but it's up to you to let them know and to find some, some course where we can all come together, some common ground. And we've got to have some common ground, particularly as it relates to inequality and pay and opportunities, inequality and power and influence, harassment in workplaces and everyday experiences like walking down the street, an assault of our bodies and our freedoms and our liberties. It is our obligation to continue the fight against these grave injustices and never stop and never give in. And that's why, since being elected Attorney General, I've made it a top priority to preserve and to advance the rights of women in this state and across the country. As we celebrate black history, I'm reminded of the words of Dr. King, who said that it is your responsibility, our responsibility, to stand up and defend those laws that improve the human conditions of others. And we, all of us, because we have been blessed with degrees, have got to change and improve the human conditions of others. We cannot just complain and we can't stand to sit in our silos and talk to individuals who think like us. It's important that we persuade others that this federal government does not represent our values and serves as an existential threat to all that we believe in. And this November, my friends, this November, my friends, this, my, my, this November, my friends, as we march into those ballots or as you do early voting, just remember what's on the ballot. What's on the ballot, my friends, is democracy, simple democracy. So stand up and make sure that you go out and vote. So as in all things, it takes me a while to warm up, but I'm going there. So my office has continually stood up to the federal government. You see, each and every day, I wake up with a fire in my belly. I walk into my office, I sue the president, and I go the hell home. That's what I do. He tweets at me, and I tweet right back. <laughs> We've, so we've stood up to a federal administration led by a president who time to time has shown callous, callous disregard for the rights of women in this country. And let me give you a few examples. In my first year as Attorney General, the Trump administration enacted baseless and dangerous restrictions to the Title X program. Title X is a life-saving program that provides federal funding for essential family planning and health care services that millions of women rely on, especially important for women in low-income communities. Women across our state depend on health care clinics that receive Title X funds, funding to get basic care such as cancer screening and STI testing and health exams and birth control. Title X funding cannot be used to provide abortions, but under the rules proposed by this administration, doctors could not discuss abortions or even refer to abortions, even in cases where a woman's very life is in jeopardy. Early on in my administration, we met with doctors and healthcare administrators about the proposal, and they all told me the same thing. Their patients rely on us for sound medical advice, and we are being asked to choose between essential funding for our facilities or providing our patients with accurate medical advice. The rules weren't just unfair. They disregarded the objective medical advice of doctors, and worst of all, they put the lives of women and young girls in danger. And so joined by other, other of my colleagues, 20 of my colleagues across this nation, we, attorney generals, who stand as the last bastion of democracy, we filed a lawsuit to challenge these restrictions. And our case is ongoing, and we are committed to using every avenue of the law 
to stand up for the care and that women deserve. You see, because I can recall when I was a city council member, little girls, teenage girls, some of them who came from intact families and some who did not, who walked into my office and said, Tish, I'm in trouble. I need your help. I can't talk to my parents. In some cases, I have no one to talk to. And I referred them all to Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood, a place where they would not be judged, a place where they can get care, a place where they can get treatment, and a place where they can get tested. And I'm so happy that some of those girls have gone on to graduate. Some of them are attorneys. Some of them are teachers. Some of them are nurses. But they went to Planned Parenthood. And we will not and should not allow Planned Parenthood to close its doors. And we will not allow Title X funds to be affected by a president who, unfortunately, is just feeding to his base. And so. And the assault on a woman's right to make her own health care decision is coming from many directions. And yes, it is your body and your choice and no one else. Because more than 45 years ago, Roe versus Wade made it clear that women hold the right to have safe and legal abortions. And yet last year alone, 10 states, 10 states tried to skirt the United States Supreme Court by passing hostile and restrictive laws to prevent women from making choices about their own bodies. And my office has taken legal action to stop these laws from taking effect in other states because a woman's right to choose is a fundamental right. And it's a, it's a fundamental to the health of our society, no matter what state she resides in. We have filed several multi-state, we have led several multi-state coalitions in filing briefs to challenge these restrictive laws. And we will continue to vigilantly monitor the legal landscape and intervene whenever necessary to defend a woman's right to choose, and most importantly, to defend Roe. I have also worked to make sure that all voices are counted in our democracy by taking the Trump administration all the way to the United States Supreme Court and blocking a patently discriminatory citizenship question from being added to the 2020 census. Julie Menon. And I want to commend Julie Menon not only on this, but when she was the Commissioner of Consumer Affairs, she and I joined together to address the issue of the feminization of poverty, which is happening in our society. It was Julie's idea that we work together to make sure that we reach out to women to ensure that they are getting an earned income tax credit and a child care tax credit. And as a result of that, significant number of women in New York City received an economic boost to their economy. And I want to thank Julie for doing that. I want to thank her so much. And I want to thank Julie because she and I walked down the steps of the Supreme Court and announced that steps that states such as New York with high numbers of immigrants would be fairly represented. And I am proud of the work my office is doing and the women and the men who are critical to these efforts. And if you ask the simple question, well, Tish, shouldn't we know how many citizens are in the United States? And I say, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. But the census has nothing to do with citizenship. The census has to do with the enumeration of all individuals in our country. And if, in fact, there is an undercount in New York State and across states, particularly in the South, it will result in less resources coming to those states to address infrastructure and social services and a wide range of other issues. We send more money to Washington than we get back, and we can ill afford to get a, a reduction in resources back to New York State. Two, I'll be damned if I lose any congressional representatives, and the census is tied to reapportionment. And right now, there's a possibility in New York State we could lose not one, but two congressional seats. And that's why all of us must knock on doors, and particularly to immigrants who are afraid of our country right now, to urge them that they, too, must be counted and that their information will be kept away from ICE and this federal government. Make no mistake, I will be relentless in pursuit of reproductive justice and in pursuit of simple justice. 
I went to Howard University School of Law with Thurgood Marshall, where he devised the civil rights movement. It was the laboratory for the civil rights struggle. I walked the halls where Thurgood Marshall sat in Vernon, Jordan. And it was really critically important that I attend that law school because he and his team dismantled a system of state-sanctioned discrimination. And I wanted to be in the halls and in a school that fed me each and every day social justice. And so I'm so proud and honored to have graduated from that law school that's taught me to stand up and speak truth to power even if you stand alone. And to root out systematic discrimination and institutional bias and to call it like you see it, no matter what's at risk. And I remember standing up to countless number of individuals in Brooklyn and all throughout the city of New York, and now as Attorney General. I also firmly believe that we must look ourselves in the mirror, too, and ask ourselves if we are living these principles, if we are doing all that we can do to protect others, if we are doing all that we can do to shield vulnerable communities, if we, are all do, if we are doing all that we can do to focus on justice and standing up for rights and liberties and democracy and defending our Constitution. And that's why I assure equality and inclusion extended to the leadership and culture of the organization I lead is so critically important. Last year, I established in my office an Office of Diversity and Inclusion in the New York State Office of Attorney General because the office was not diverse enough. And it was really critically important that we have diversity and it reflect New York State and New York City in particular. And we have consistently hired and trained and promoted women within the office. Over half of my senior leadership team is made up of women, including some Columbia alumni. I don't need to tell the women in this room about all the things women can accomplish and achieve, but I do want to take a moment to underscore just how important lending your voice to the dialogue around elections and public policy is. Today, we are celebrating the 100th year anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment when women were granted the right to vote. This was an extraordinary and hard fought achievement the right to vote is critical to how we raise our voices as women. It is how we demand the changes we know we deserve and the policies we know are good for women and families and for our economy and the leadership that includes and that values inclusion and compassion. And there is still so much more to be done in this country to make it a fair and just place for all, including for women. My challenge to all of you is to get more involved in politics than ever before. And I'm talking about more than just voting for a presidential election, because we all know that politics starts from the bottom up. And so it's important that you know your city council members, your state elected officials, your assembly member, your senator, your congressional representatives. I'm talking about step stepping up and getting involved and moving away from your comfort zones. In the same way that women like Shirley Chisholm and Zora Neale Hurston opened up the doors for us, we must open up the doors for those who will follow us. And there will be times in your life, just as they are, they are in mine, where individuals will count you out. Individuals will say you're not good enough, you're too fat, you're too ugly, you're not qualified enough, you're not smart enough, this is too difficult for you. Well. To those detractors who may even be in this room, don't look at them, just look at me. <laughs> don't, don't look at them. As they say in Brooklyn, let your haters be your waiters. <laughs> and so, there will be those who want to write you off and those who want to tell your story and define your story. Remember, we are united in sisterhood determined to write our own destiny. And we do not erect barriers, we break them. And so go out there and be bold. Raise your voice and share your opinion. Volunteer for a candidate or issue you believe in. Travel to a battleground state where your help is needed. Run for office, be the change you wanna see. Again, rip up those speeches that you don't like. <laughs> Even on national television, rip them up. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
rip them up, stare them down, check your hair, what does what the song say? Check your nails, chip, and, and, and what is it? I forget anyway. It's this little song that I heard I really loved. Check your nails and toss your hair. I think that's the song. Anyway, and remember, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring your own chair. And thank you for all that you have done thus far. And thank you for all the little girls out there. Thank you for all the little girls out there who can now look at all of you and who can say, if they made it, that I can make it. That there's no mountain too high and no ceiling too high. And if they can dream, we've got to tell them and remind them each and every day to dream big because there is so much at risk right now in this country and we've got so much to do. And so I just want to thank Columbia for supporting and for educating and for all that you are doing for women and for lifting up women and for changing the direction of their life. And I want to thank all of you for allowing me to have some fun. <laughs> and for allowing me to say a few words to you. But most important, I want all of you to understand the power of the law and how you and I and all of us are inextricably tied to one another at this point in time in history and that there be no space between us. But it's up to us, it's up to us women to make a difference and to change this country. God bless you and thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Letitia. I so appreciate your leadership, your example, and your call to action. Now I'd like to introduce our next keynote speakers, two formidable women that I have watched and admired for many years. Christiane Amanpour, a parent of a 2023 student at Columbia College, is, is CNN's chief international anchor of the network's award-winning flagship global affairs program, Amanpour. You probably have seen her work and admired her courage. She has won numerous awards and has guided us through everything from the 1991 Gulf War to the Arab Spring. <clears throat> Poppy Harlow is a 2005 graduate of Columbia College and a twice Emmy-nominated journalist who anchors the weekday edition of CNN Newsroom. Many of us, including me, were blown away two years ago when just a few days after giving birth, Poppy interviewed Ruth Bader Ginsburg on this stage at our inaugural She Opened the Door. Please join me in welcoming Christiane and Poppy. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much to Columbia uh, for having us. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Thank you for those powerful remarks from Attorney General James. It's an honor to be here with someone I've admired my whole life, but <laughs> is a, I'm lucky that you're my friend. That's and what that it's all about, especially in this struggle. That's true. Female friendship. And that we get to have important chats mm -hmm. and make up in the morning <laughs> whenever she's in New York. I hope to get to sit next to her. Thanks to everyone for having you. Not you today. Can, you can <laughs> look beautiful, and we're going to start off with what you're wearing, and there's a reason for that in a moment. Yeah. You'll see why. Her sweater. Uh, but I just want to spend one minute telling you about the Christiane that I know, because you can all read her remarkable bio online, and I mean, countless, countless awards, 13 Emmys, five Peabody's, Edward R. Murrow, multiple DuPonts. She's also the one who gets the gets, the most sought after interviews when they matter the most. That's why we're so lucky to have her at CNN. Uh, 
the only journalist to interview Muammar Gaddafi and Hosni Mubarak during the Arab Spring, in addition to one woman on one of those other interviews, and there's a great story there. Uh, and she's been called the unbreakable newswoman. But the woman she is to me, <clears throat> I got an interview with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. And I had been trying for a year to get this interview. And it was actually largely about women and equality. And I told Christiane about it in makeup. And it was in the middle of some very busy political cycle, so I wasn't even going to be able to get that much of it on my show the next morning. What did Christiane do? She said, I'm going to air it on my show. She took a huge chunk of the interview and put it on her show. And that is what being a friend and a colleague is. So thank you yeah. for that. I'll never forget that. So let's begin with what you're wearing. Okay. I say in jest, but if you could read her sweater, what does it say? So it says, be truthful, not neutral. And that, for me, follows, of course, what Letitia James said about you know, speaking truth to power and being honest and, 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 and being brave enough to be truthful when most of the body politic wants you to be neutral. I, I, in other words, on the one hand, on the other hand, all sides are equal and et cetera. And I learned very early on, and maybe we can discuss it uh, throughout the conversation, that actually that's not objectivity. Objectivity is not being neutral and treating sides that are not equal equally. Objectivity is not about drawing a false factual or false moral equivalence. And in my career, I found that that is uh, absolutely you know, vital to remember, whether it's covering genocide, as I did in Bosnia all the years I was a foreign correspondent and elsewhere, or whether it's covering climate. Because as you know, for many decades, um, the deniers have been held in equal esteem and weight as the science and the, and the empirical, you know, factual evidence. And that's what's kept us back from actually any kind of movement and motion on these very important issues. I, I should know, Christiane refuses to have climate deniers on I your show. I do refuse, yeah. So, so this, this moment, and we'll, we'll start here, and then we'll back into your remarkable journey. But what has, along the lines of truthful, not neutral, what has the Trump administration taught you about journalism? You had to go there. I just, you know. <laughs> you know, it's been a very difficult four years, certainly for journalists in the United States, because for the first time in modern memory, there's been a sustained uh, attack on journalists and journalism and facts and the truth. Uh, this is not the first time it's happened in history. It happened, you know, to an extent under President Richard Nixon. It's happened under many, many presidents who kind of don't want you to get under their skin, to hold them accountable and the like. It happens all the time. But because our era is so exponentially, you know, explosive because of social media, because everybody's now siloed, everybody just talks to their base, or does the opposite of what Letitia James said. Every, everybody's in their own echo chamber. And there's very little you know, attempt at consensus and, and walking across the aisle, whether it's in politics or in journalism or wherever it might be. So this toxicity has entered you know, our profession in a way that it's, it's very difficult to remember. Um, we can go back to the George W. Bush and the Iraq war, because there was sure. a problem there as well. But it's very much you know, a situation where the leader of, of the democratic superpower has taken on characteristics in this regard, which are usually exhibited by leaders of authoritarian regimes or dictatorships or the others. Um, in other words, silence the messenger. And that's kind of what's happening. And therefore, I think that we have to just remember what our, what our role is. Here in the United States, the press is called the fourth estate. Of course. You know, we don't, in where I come from in Great Britain and elsewhere, there is no constitutional guarantee of a First Amendment, no constitutional protection for journalists. Um, but we really have to fight this fight, because without the truth, you can't even have, without facts, you can't even have disagreements. If you don't actually have a basis of, of, of facts and truth and evidence and individual bravery and institutional bravery and the willingness to stand against a very powerful tide to do your job, um, it's, it's very, very difficult. And, and to, again, to Letitia James's point, she has, she's talked about defending law. 
and I would just add defending the rule of law because you know the difference between the rule of law and anarchy is the difference between democracy and dictatorship and the difference between truth and lies which is the business I'm in to try to bring the truth to light is the difference between democracy and dictatorship so I'm incredibly aware of that one follow-up I know that you would very much like to interview the president still yeah what is the most pressing thing you'd ask him? Well, it depends on what day of the week or what hour of the day. Tomorrow. <laughs> I think I would ask him, um, um, uh, as well as a lot of you know, key political issues, you know, the president has come off an incredibly successful week. Yes. And the question is, what do you do when you have political success? Mm -hmm. Do you knit a country together when you're planning to run for re-election? Do you continue? Do you see a strategy that's, that's worked for you? Um, you know, his ratings are up at a record level. He was acquitted. Uh, you know, there's a whole load of stuff that has gone yeah. his way. Yeah. So I think that, you know, one of, for me as a journalist, I'm lucky enough to have a program where I can kind of sit back somewhat and not be involved in the conflict du jour, and not be involved in the sometimes manufactured conflict that certain television and other media platforms rely on, thinking that that's how you get eyeballs. I tend not to do talking heads who are fighting each other. I try to go to the players, I try to go to, the, um, uh, to, to all sides, I try to get a consensus, and go to the issues of what's going on and hold whoever I can accountable, but also to explain and to, you know, to get them to defend whatever they're doing. Uh, so, so, I mean, there, that's obviously, I'm not gonna lay out my interview strategy right now, but there's, there's plenty I'd like to ask him. And you know, I have had- I think you'll get that interview. I don't think so. I think- C He doesn't like CNN for the moment. I think you'll get the interview. Okay. She also has a show that is on PBS. Yeah. I will help you. You've yeah. helped me so many times. Right. Of course I will help you. Okay, let's go back to Iran. Yeah. Let's go back to your childhood. Let's go back to the Iranian Revolution, 1979. I mean, people should know your family fled Iran. You, you lost your country. You lost family members and friends through that. How has that shaped the rest of your life? Well, I think it's been obviously the fundamental turning point and change agent in my life, the revolution, because I was at a stage when I could have, I, w I was meant to be sort of figuring out what to do with the rest of my life when it happened. I was about 20. The truth of the matter is that I didn't do well enough in my high school British exams to go to medical school, which is what I thought I wanted to do, be a doctor. Thank goodness and you didn't go to well, medical school. I was sort of wandering around in the sort of professional wilderness with, you know, worried about my life and what I was going to do with it. And boom, comes a revolution. And I'm thinking, well, now I've got to sink or swim. You know, now I can no longer rely on mommy and daddy to provide my life. And, you know, maybe I'd have had an arranged marriage. Maybe I'd have stayed. Who knows? Maybe I'd never been a professional. Who knows what would have happened, wow. um, you know, to me had I stayed in Iran without having gone to medical school or whatever. And I lived in Iran. I lived the, all the, the whole year of the revolution, which started in January 1978 and culminated in February of 1979 when the Ayatollah came. Um, so I was old enough and alert enough and awake enough to realize that actually this thing that I was witnessing in my own homeland was something that I was riveted by and that I thought that perhaps I could tell these kinds of stories to the world as a job. And um, that's what made me want to do journalism. And I came here to the United States. I went to the University of Rhode Island. I studied journalism and then I got my job well, I did some internships in Providence, and then I got my job at CNN, which at the time was a startup. And it was very important for me because I, I wouldn't have been able to do the, the, the traditional way a, journal, right. a television journalist That's rises right. in this country. Tell, tell the audience what your first job actually was at CNN. Well, you know, I'd been told all over the country when I sent resumes and tapes that were non-existent, but I sort of made yeah. and sent, and that, that, that I didn't have the right accent, the right hair, the right eyes, the right anything. I just didn't look the part of what women were on television in 1983. It's completely changed now, which is a great victory and a great move. 
all sorts of women of color, of different you know, backgrounds, of socioeconomic, uh, cultural, and, and, and just, it's just a different game than it was when I was starting out. Um, so I went to, to CNN, and um, they wanted me to be a, what we call a graphics designer, which was the words under, you know, the chyrons. The words actually you very read. important. You well, very important. Yeah, yeah, but I didn't actually want to go that direction. I wanted to be a foreign <laughs> correspondent. So they said, they said when I got there, oh, you're foreign. We need somebody on the foreign desk. They just quit. So you're going to go on the foreign desk. So I thought this was great. Um, but I started right at the bottom. Yeah. And, um, and I just climbed my way up, which I loved, actually, because and for any young woman or young boy who's thinking about their career, one of the greatest aspects, I think, of a, of, of a successful, fun career where you're all in is actually to start at the bottom and yeah, move to the top. I it's not to try agree. to get to the top immediately because even though sometimes you can now because the system has so changed, everybody's lateraling instead of verticaling, um, it's, it's so empowering to learn from the very bottom and to sort of steadily move up and also to make friends as you, as you move up and to develop not just a competence but a camaraderie. And that, at the end of the day, the camaraderie, the team spirit is what sustains you, particularly in what I call the kind of extreme career that I had because I'm only recently you know, on a desk before most of my career was in the field, in, 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 in war and crisis and disaster, and you, it's difficult. You've said I'm a, I'm a reporter at heart, not an anchor. Yeah. So talk about being sent and really getting this big break, big break and as you, you describe yourself then as Miss Eager, yeah. being sent and landing the gig at CNN in Frankfurt, because it seemed like that was a moment, I mean, that yeah, changed well, everything for well, you. Well, you know, CNN, you know, they'd had all its correspondence, and it was very junior. I was finally, you know, sort of a lot of, lot of dead man's shoes, and dead man's shoes, by the way. I never entered into, there wasn't Woman's a woman stop. in front yes. of me. It was always a, a, a guy, and again, that's changed radically. There's so many women um, on the air and behind the scenes in our business right now, which is very, very good. But uh, not enough at, at the top. No, we'll the C-suite has to have, we need female presidents of networks. Absolutely. Um, yes, because that's where the decisions are made, on hiring, on storytelling, on all sorts of things. But yeah, I was really happy to get a job that nobody else wanted, because for whatever reason, Frankfurt was not considered a, a top plum assignment. But the guy who was a friend of mine who was offered the job didn't want to go, and I called them up, and yes, it was CNN, man. It's like 1990. They were not as organized as maybe ABC, CBS, blah, blah, blah. And they were just glad somebody wanted to go. So, <laughs> uh, so they sent me. But of course, what was fabulous was that about two months after I landed in Frankfurt, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And that was the beginning of, of my career as a war correspondent. Because I said, I'll go, I'll go. And they went, no, we've got all these senior guys who are going to go to Iraq and to Saudi and to all the rest. Of course, none of them could get in because yeah. it required visas and this and that. So I just booked me and my team from Frankfurt to the closest place, which was Dubai, yeah. which was, was not Dubai as it is today. It was like a fishing village. So you went anyway. They an said no, and you went anyway. Yeah, I went. Well, no, finally they said go because we can't get anybody oh, else okay. to go. So I said, great, I've got the tickets. I've got the, you know, the, the booking. And we went, and then it was just, you know, that, I mean, I was lucky to cut a long story short <laughs> that my career flourished in public at the same time CNN developed in public, because 1990 right. is what put CNN it really on everything. the map, particularly internationally, because that was the war where all the world leaders were kind of negotiating on CNN and while we were live and, you know, satellite technology really came into its own at that time. It was a massive you know, leg up for this startup. And that put CNN on the map, and it put me on the map. You were in Baghdad when it was liberated? Uh, uh, yes, when it was liberated, but I was in um, Saudi Arabia at the beginning, which in and of itself That's was a great crazy. story. Yeah. Well, talk a little bit about Saudi in the context of women, and I believe you were an all-female team. Was. Mm -hmm. So, but, th but that to you proved to be quite an advantage in Saudi. It was, it was. I mean, again, CNN didn't quite twig that this was a major patriarchal society where women were not allowed to drive, were not allowed to work, were not allowed to frankly be visible in public. Again, 1990. And, and because all the guys were getting the plum assignments to where, you know, Saddam Hussein, that was the interview to get, so fine. 
a great female camera woman and a great female sound woman and me, we were told to go to Saudi Arabia. So we did, and we just, we just ignored the fact that you know, women were meant to be second class citizens, and we just carried on. And it just came to me when one of my colleagues, also a woman, the great Geraldine uh, Brooks, of formerly Wall Street Journal and now a Pulitzer Prize winning author, she wrote um, this article, having gone to these sort of majlesses, these gatherings of men in Riyadh and uh, the capital, and they were all furious that CNN had had the temerity to send three women to Saudi Arabia to cover this story. And I'm, that's the first time it occurred to me that there was a problem. But anyway, we didn't, we didn't, uh, we didn't, we didn't. The, the thing is, you can either be cowed by it or be defiant. And we just were defiant and carried yeah. on. And it, and it was great. And we really, and, and it was in, in the end to our advantage because, and then it, I found in many patriarchal societies, being a woman was an advantage because they were so unused to seeing us. And men's general first uh, instinct is to open the door, right? In those days, open the door, let you go forth. So open the door, stick your foot in the door, don't take it don't out. Don't take it out. And, <laughs> and that's, what that, that's what we did. What, <clears throat> as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that Yasser Arafat hung the phone yes, up on you very one sad. time mm. and told you to be quiet. Yes. Tell us. Well, this was on live television. To be fair, he was under some pressure. Uh, <laughs> Ariel Sharon, who at the time was the Prime Minister of Israel, had decided after a series of terrorist attacks that he wasn't going to take it anymore. And he launched a, a major military offensive into what at that time was pretty much the, the beginnings of a Palestinian state in the, in the West Bank. This was in 2002-ish. And what he did was, I mean, they essentially you know, bulldozed their way through, including into the compound that, that Arafat was, you know, had. It was an official compound. It was after the Oslo Accord. There was a peace process between Israel and the Palestinians. Um, helmed, I mean, it was, it was done by this famous team of Norwegian diplomats. Um, it was called the Oslo Accord. It was shepherded by President Clinton and, and the international community at that time. So it was 93, 94, and it was still, they were still working it out by 2002. In any event, um, Arafat, we got him, I think this, this evening was when there must have been another terrorist attack. He was, he was uh, stuck in his compound, which had been bulldozed, so there was like a, he was in a room with some aides. And we got him on the TV, on the phone, rather, to, for live television. And I don't know what I asked him, but he said, he got very upset, and he said, you are talking to General Arafat? And then something like, don't be so stupid, or something, boom, on live television, he hung up. And you know, some people say, oh, that's great television. For me, it was just really embarrassing. And I went red and scarlet and whatever, and, and what could I do? What could I do? Nothing. I hung up. How do you get the big interviews? Because I, I remember a mentor of mine, really when I had just started at CNN, I, you know, I got a gig online basically and I was really lucky because they were just starting video online and I'd never been on live television before and one of my mentors said to me, just get the big interviews. Just get the, get, I was business correspondent. Then. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I remember that moment and it changed my life and it changed my career, get them when they matter. How do you convince people to talk to you? Well, I think I had a slightly different route than you did. Because I think that I, I didn't go for the interviews. That wasn't what my career was but when I was starting. So many. Now, yeah, but it's all because of the journey, I think. I mean, you yeah. ask me how I think, I think yeah. that. I don't ask them why they came to me, because I'm just glad I get them. <laughs> and I don't want to, you know, spoil <laughs> the situation. Um, but I think it's because. To be frank, I think it's because I've walked the walk. I've been there, I've been in those places for more than 20 years, nearly 25 years from the first Gulf War until I first sat behind an anchor desk. And people saw me, that's again the, 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 the value and the, the great thing about CNN, it is a global entity, it's, right, it's stamped in everybody's mind. You can't get away from CNN because it's absolutely, has provided an amazing, unique service you know, for so long, for so many decades. And um, I think all these people who I want to interview have been watching me on television. 
and they they know that I'm fair, and they know that I'll I'll that I that I'm fair, and that I give them a decent amount of time to talk. Um, and if they you know they choose, sometimes I don't get the interviews, but a lot I do, and I'm very grateful about it. I mean, for instance, you mentioned in the Arab Spring, yeah. I wasn't at CNN then. I had done what I call my off-campus assignment yes, for a brief to time a to ABC. ABC. That's the way I... We're very... I remember, by the way, can I just interject here, reading the memo that you were going to ABC. I was on a shoot in Philadelphia, uh, in, in Pennsylvania, rather, outside of Philadelphia, and I got this memo from at the head of CNN at the time, and I was, I could, I was devastated. And I just remember sitting on a park bench reading that. How could we lose her? I came back. And you came back. Yeah. I came back to you. So glad. I, I mean, it wasn't exactly, you know, I mean, it, uh, ABC was great, but just not exactly in the way I thought it was going to be. Um, so the Arab Spring. So, but the Arab Spring happened when I was there. <clears throat> but this is really interesting because I think about it. Um, I did get Mubarak. I, I interviewed President Mubarak while he was holed up in his palace and about three or four days before he finally stepped down. Everybody wanted Mubarak. But I had interviewed him many times before for CNN. I don't even know. I, didn't, I don't think he knew I was working for ABC or who. He just knew, knew me. So I got that. And that was a major, major coup. And I was very pleased about it. And then a couple of months later, we went, because Libya was uprising then. And I went to Libya, and I got uh, Muammar Gaddafi. And it was the last interview with Muammar Gaddafi before he met his grisly end. Um, and the way I did that was another great story about teamwork and collaboration with a, a female colleague, the late beloved Marie Colvin, who's an American journalist who worked for the London Sunday Times, and she was an excellent foreign correspondent. And she also had had a huge amount of experience um, abroad before me. She'd started before me. And uh, the two of us pooled our resources. Literally, I went to the people who I knew uh, on the ground in Tripoli. She went to the people who she knew. And together, we got Muammar Gaddafi. And that was a big deal as well. I mean, it was a very, very big It was the last interview he gave. And then, you know, what happened to him? What interview has changed your life the most? Ooh. Or has changed the world the most? Ooh. Changed what story? It doesn't need to be an interview. What story for you? Oh, what well, for sure, you? what story is Bosnia? I mean, for sure. <laughs> um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's still very, very raw. And, and this is where this comes from. But you know my, my husband was I do know. born in Bosnia. Yes. I do know. Um, I was a young correspondent with virtually no experience other than this, the Gulf War, which was a, the last of the traditional set-piece wars, where you had two or three sides with their ground forces and their infantry and their air force and their ships and the whole shebang, as we know, warfare to be. And I covered that. And then within, I mean, the summer after the, the first Gulf War ended, the Balkans exploded. And that was basically in modern times, the first of the new generation of wars, which was a side against, not another side, but against civilians. So in this case, it was the Serbs of uh, Slobodan Milosevic and his group in Bosnia called the Bosnian Serbs who wanted to cleanse territory to take it for them to make a greater Bosnia because they didn't want an independent Bosnia that had the majority was the Muslims and it was a whole power struggle. So what they did um, was ethnic cleansing, as we called it then, which as we know now was genocide. It's been adjudicated before the International Criminal Tribunal. Uh, the henchmen who ordered this have been taken to trial, convicted. Many of them are serving life sentences. So there's not an argument about what happened. But during the time that it was happening, there was an argument because the world did not want to accept its responsibility. Talk about law and the rule of law and international law. Since World War II, as we all know, the Geneva Conventions state that if genocide is happening, the international community has a legal obligation to do all it can to stop it and to intervene. But of course, that's exactly what the world did not want to do at that time. You spent, I believe, four years? Yeah, the whole war there. I mean, you, know, you were from 92, just there. Yeah. And me and, and colleagues, but we were very, very in your face every single day. And it was a different 
landscape for news as well, where international stories were respected in a much more different way than they are today. That reporters on the ground telling the story all the time was, you know, top of the fold on the New York Times and yeah. the Washington Post and the LA Times, top of the news on the BBC and CNN and ABC and everywhere and on radios. And so that story, I believe, uh, changed me because we had to make a decision to be truthful or neutral, to go with what the powers that be were saying was that all sides were equally guilty, therefore we cannot intervene, we shouldn't intervene, everybody hates each other, it's centuries of ethnic cleansing, of, of sorry, of ethnic uh, struggle. Um, and of course it wasn't that. I mean, it just wasn't that. It was the slaughter of a minority by a much better uh, armed majority with, a, with, a, with an aim to clear land and to clear the people, even if it meant slaughtering them and killing them and putting them in mass graves and shoving them with backhoes. And, and, and that's the story we told. And it was very, very hard. And we were, I was, I, I was very much um, questioned. People said, oh, Christian, she's gone over to the other side. Oh, she's lost her objectivity, which is where I made the definition of objectivity, that it is to be truthful, not neutral. And if in, and just in case you're wondering whether it's a self-serving definition, it's not. Because, you know, truth is the objective truth, and you can find the objective truth. And if you're neutral in genocide or anything else, you are an accomplice. And I knew enough that I was not going to be an accomplice. And that stayed with me forever, and that's what informs all my journalism. And I think it also shows the power of the platform mm -hmm. and the power that you and all journalists hold uh, and the importance of shedding light. Because not long after, we see Rwanda. Yeah. Nearly a million people well, slaughtered in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And so much of the West and the media essentially sat on its hands. Well, right. And so I why, say, why? well, I and think you, we because people make choices. You know, the, the leaderships of our businesses make choices about where they're going to put, put resources. And, and also, there's sometimes there are other things happening, like stories that are counter narratives. So, so if, if I think that what we did as journalists eventually basically stopped the war, it made our democracies they couldn't continue to look away while civilians were being slaughtered. They just couldn't continue to look away. So they came in late after the massacre in Srebrenica, but they came in and they bombed a few military emplacements. The war was over. And then they put a peace process in called the Dayton Peace Accords. That happened. And the peace still holds. It is not perfect. There are all sorts of issues around it. But the peace holds and not a single NATO soldier who came to patrol the peace was killed in any kind of conflict. Yes, in accidents and this, that, but not at all in any conflict or, or, or anything like that. And because of what we did in Bosnia, we made it impossible for these same democracies, AKA the United States, Britain, France, all the members of the United Nations Security Council, etc. When it came to Kosovo and Slobodan Milosevic tried the same dirty mm -hmm. trick, it was not possible because the government said we will not allow him to get away in Kosovo with what we allowed him to get away with in Bosnia. So that's the success of when we put our resources, our minds, our focus, and tell the stories. By contrast, the great failure is when we don't. So in Rwanda, in the April to June of 1994, uh, when this unbelievable bloodletting started, and when people on the ground, like the great General Dallaire of Canada, you know, tried to warn uh, the world what was happening, the United States and all its allies decided that it wasn't going to intervene. intervene. And the press um, was distracted as well, because at the time, there was a great news, a good news story happening in South Africa. It was the election of the first black president in South Africa, Nelson Mandela. And all network resources and were there. people were there. And it was genuinely a fantastic story. In the United yeah. States, it was OJ Simpson yes. was happening at the end. Uh, of this, of this uh, genocide. Yeah. Yeah. And the bottom line is a million Rwandans were slaughtered in low industrial method with machetes and clubs while the world did in three nada. Months. In three months. What, what is the untold story 
of our time? What, what do you wake up every morning Climate and... is not told enough. I mean, there are all these other stories that are going on, obviously. You know, there's still wars, there's still crisis and disaster. There's, I mean, obviously, a story that is being told, but it's very, very, very dangerous, is the gradual disintegration of our democracy, of our institutions, um, of the rule of law, uh, of all of that kind of stuff. And we have to be very careful about that, including of our, of our baseline about what truth and facts mean. In the lead up to the Brexit referendum in 2016 in Britain, um, then, I don't know whether he was a minister, but he was, he was, he was uh, a Tory politician, the name of, his name is Michael Gove, and he was a pro-Brexiteer, and he basically said, the British people have had enough of experts. Sure. And, you know, this was before the Trump election and all the rest of it, but this is what, what certain people in power are using. So what it means is, to hell with the facts and the science and the evidence and whatever, and the truth, we'll just tell the story as we see it. And this is a real problem. So that's, I think we have to be major vigilant about that. But then also about climate. And as I said, climate has suffered from the same kind of international negligence um, that Bosnia suffered from. I, you know, I think there's a, there's a perception that climate, doesn't, climate coverage doesn't rate, whether it's television. But I think it's wrong. CNN held, I think it was seven hours of straight climate town halls with a number of the 2020 Democratic candidates a few months ago, and they did right. exceptionally well. Yes. You do it on your show yeah, yeah. all the time. So it's just, like it, it's, it seems to be a myth. Well, it is a myth, but also, you know, one has to, 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 to do storytelling. You know, David Attenborough, everybody yeah. knows David Attenborough, right? Yeah. His Blue Planet, Planet yeah. Earth, or all Or Bill Weir's work. work at our Yeah, network. but David Attenborough yeah. has moved the needle. Yes. Um, and, and on plastics and on all sorts of things, and that's, that's reporting. It's the natural world, but it's reporting. And, and so the idea is that you have to, I think, put in the, uh, what you need to put in to tell the stories. And you just, of course, it's boring if you just have talking heads. Of course. If you just have panels and well, talking heads. That's the easy heads. way to do yeah. it. Yeah. But I mean, I would say for young people, it's a major issue right now. College, on college campuses, everywhere. We know that in, in elections, climate, certainly in, in Europe and elsewhere, and it's probably going to show up. I don't know about the midterm elections in 18, but it's probably going to show up in the 2020. Climate is a big motivating election issue for young people, and they come out and they vote. And Greta Thunberg has moved the dial. She has literally moved the dial. One, I mean, just think about it. One child, one child who sat on the steps of the Swedish parliament and then inspired a generation yes. of children all over the world who had the temerity and the guts to leave school every Friday to go and march. Mm -hmm. And those stories didn't get enough coverage. Yeah. Why weren't we out there doing those? And, and, I, and, and this is really serious, because this kind of stuff, especially if it's, if it's shown, in, has a ripple effect mm -hmm. of inspiring and educating and moving. And you know, I believe that good journalism in important spaces can shift the momentum and can, can make, can create a turning point. Mm -hmm. um, and for instance, let's just, from a, 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 a journalist who covers um, Paris was reporting on the height. Do you remember the Gilets Jaunes, all these people in Paris who came out? Um, but what did they do? They smashed cars, they burned tires, they smashed buildings, they did all, the, where did the press go? There. The same day, in a different neighborhood, was one of these climate marches where there were Thousands and thousands and thousands of peaceful protesters, not a single camera. Yeah. So we have the power to shape public perception. And that's an awesome responsibility, an awful responsibility as well. And I do believe that we have a massive responsibility, those of us who wield this power. But I also really believe now that everybody else has a massive responsibility because I hear so many people say to me, I don't know where to go to hear the truth, I don't know what to believe, I don't know this, I don't know that. Well, it exists. It exists in the established brand names of journalism. It exists at CNN, it exists at ABC, it exists at all the other networks, it exists at PBS, it exists at the New York Times, it exists at the Atlantic, it exists at the Wall Street Journal, it exists. And people now have to make a decision to yeah. go and find where the truth is and be informed. Because, 
it's really a powerful thing. And too many people are believing conspiracy theories and, and all this kind of stuff, which the internet exponentially um, exposes and gives, gives the oxygen to. Uh, I'd like to spend the last few minutes we have before we get to some of your audience questions, which I've worked in here as well, but we'll get to some of those in a minute, talking about you as a woman, talking about this moment. So let's begin with the Me Too, not just moment, but movement. What has it meant to you personally and as a journalist? Have you, have you been harassed? I don't think anybody would dare. <laughs> the truth I is, haven't either, and I, 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 it's weird to feel like, like we're the lucky ones. Well, yes. I mean, I have been not harassed in a sexual, predatory way. And I also have, I mean, even if it was coming towards me, I really, I blocked it before it got mm -hmm. within, you know, 50 feet of me. Um, but I have, you know, definitely, experience the opposite side of that, you know, oh, you're too ballsy, you're too bossy, you're too, you know, you're too all of that kind of stuff. Someone the called typical, my daughter bossy yes. this week and I lost my mind. You and she's said, three, but and you, I you said, you can't said, use that word. You should have said, oh, yes, I am, and I'm going to own it. <laughs> okay, there's that. You know, or call me feisty, you know, all of that kind of stuff. No, look, what it's meant, I think, is that I have plenty of friends who have been harassed and who have who have, you know, suffered from this uh, situation that exists in all uh, businesses and across, the, across the spectrum, in all institutions, whether it's in the church, mm -hmm. whether it's in, you know, it's boys, it's girls, it's, it's just all over the place. Um, and I think that what the Me Too exposure and what, you know, Jodie Cantor, Meg, Megan Toohey, yeah. um, uh, Ronan Farrow and the others have done is drawn a line. You know, they've said, this happened, We've reported it, we've exposed it. Now there's a line. Now there is a baseline of behavior mm -hmm. that's in public. I do think we need to, you know, I don't think everybody's a war criminal, and I think there are shades of gray, and I think it's very, very important for our boys as well to understand that this is not a war against boys and men, that this must be bringing in boys and men, because without them, we cannot survive and we cannot thrive. It has to be a global um, uh, solution to this issue. And to that end, I do believe, um, and I would like to do some further reporting from the Sex and Love Around the World series that I did, which was series. intimacy and relationships and all the rest of it through the eyes of women. Mm -hmm. I would like to try to do another series, but through much more the eyes of young boy, boys, adolescents and, and, and young men, because I think that it is, it is true that there is much criminal behavior that is directed at women. There's no doubt about it. Um, but there's also a lack of, of, of time that has been spent on in, in educating boys, uh, their mothers, their father, yeah. in their emotional health, in their emotional well-being, in what it means to be a boy in today's world. You know, it's not just about man up or get laid or, you know, bag a hot chick or whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? Uh, or win, win, win. It's, 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 it's a much more complex, they are complex beings as well. And we need to, I think, um, certainly as a journalist anyway, uh, we need to be able to, to that, that's an inclusive space that I think we should well really said, work on. Well said, and not enough yeah. focus or coverage. Yeah. I agree. You have said, I negotiate like a man. Teach me, and what does that mean? How do you negotiate for yourself? Well, well this is about salaries. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't really know what to say, except that I'm not going to put up with being, you know, um, Did Have you classed. gotten offers before through your career that you knew were less than men doing equal you work? Know, I have to say, I didn't, I didn't really know. I didn't, it wasn't really on our radar at that time. I do know that for a period of time, I think I was the highest paid person at, a reporter at CNN. And sometimes, I don't, it, it's not true anymore, I don't think. Because certainly there's anchors who have played a lot more. But I do remember um, a very fantastic president of CNN, you know, many years ago, Tom Johnson, who, who gave me my big leg up. He made me chief international correspondent. He gave me a big, big raise from, you know, down here to up here. 
Um, and I think a lot of people talked about it, and when people you know, wrote about it, nobody knew what it was or the figure, but when I knew that it was a raise, um, and when people talked about it or wrote about it, they always used to say, I don't know, the highest paid foreign correspondent. And for a long time, I was massively embarrassed until I realized, no, I should be owning this. Yes. Yes, and this is what women who are competent should have, just like the men. There shouldn't be a, a two-tier mm. system. And, and again, with this, this whole equal salary and equal pay thing, I mean, you know that there's a clock whereby, I don't know, we could stop working in October, you know, because we only yeah, paid 75, whatever it is, cents on the dollar. Just, just stop working. Can you imagine the world would come to an end? I cannot imagine. To an end. You know, but I do think also in many of the issues that we face right now, I think solidarity is a very yeah. underused and underutilized thing. Whether it's when the president looks out and criticizes one journalist and, or bans another from a trip or the secretary of state or whoever it might be, American, Russian, British, whoever it is, you know, then all of us should say all for one, one for all, like yep. NATO. An attack on one is an attack on all. Article 5. I think it would change things in our sphere. I, think I really right. do. And, you know, what about choosing a date in October where all women just put down tools? Wow. Can you imagine? For a day. For a day. Let's talk about um, what I but think. But by the way, voting is really, uh, is really important. And all women and girls and men and yeah. boys should be voting. I just went to see... Um, American Utopia. I don't know whether anybody's I, uh, been. Uh, Haley, my producer, oh, it's said it's amazing. just phenomenal. David Byrne of the Talking Heads, and he's done this amazing concert plus some talk. But he has a, a register to vote table yep. in the lobby, and it's anybody anywhere across the country. Good. And I say this as a non-American. I don't vote in this country. I'm not American, but I do vote in my country, and I take it very seriously because I came from a dictatorship. So I take voting seriously. Um, and, I, and he said, yeah, you know, the last time around presidential election, it was the highest turnout ever, highest voting, 55%. That's shameful. And then, as Letitia said, in, in, in local elections, it's about 20%. But you know, you get what you sow. You want to have a voice at the table, you're going to have to step up. You're going to have to vote. Have to vote. And your vote counts, and elections matter. Let's end on... Um what I think is perhaps the hardest work, I think uh, the most underappreciated work in this country, and that is being a parent. Mm. You have, you said in the 90s that you never thought you'd, had a child, you'd have a child, mm. and your son Darius is a student here at Columbia, and you couldn't do your career the way that you wanted to and were doing with a child. And then one of your producers said something that really changed your life. Do you remember what mm -hmm. they said to you? Yeah. Well, it's a little bit self-serving, but he said to me, um, so, Christiane, you want to cuddle up with your awards for the rest of your life? Uh, <laughs> so um, that sort of made me think. But to be very fair, I will say that when I was, as we say, balls to the wall in war zones, there is no way I could have achieved what I did had right. I been a wife or a mother. I was very lucky to have had that opportunity after I'd achieved a certain, a, t a certain experience and I'd done, an, and I was late, you know, I was 40 and 40, 42 when I had my, my son. Um, so I was very, very lucky to have that opportunity yes. and to have that amazing, you know, chance. But I didn't think about it because I didn't think I would survive. I, did, I didn't even know whether I was gonna live through this, much less, you know, you know, I mean, so many of our, Bosnia was the first war in which they started deliberately targeting journalists. Yes. Before Bosnia, it was, you know, if you were unlucky, caught in the crossfire, etc. But Bosnia was deliberate. And um, so many of my colleagues were killed and wounded. And, you, you know, I was just so, so involved in, in this storytelling. And, and it wasn't, oh, I have a career and therefore, it was, it was this this storytelling, and I didn't have the bandwidth. I, I couldn't have left the field and gone home like I should have done, you know, had I been But look at your career since. Yes, well, which, is, which I think, I hope, hopefully it's hopeful for women who are having this struggle and these questions. I think that you can do a lot of stuff and, and, and achieve the whole gamut of satisfaction, whether it's, it's, 
it's whether it's family, whether it's motherhood, whether it's you know career, whatever it might be. I'm just not sure you can do it all at the same time yeah. and do it all well at the same time. Many people have to, and they don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. But it's such a stress, and we know so many, so many you know mothers who are doing you know ten different jobs to keep body and soul you know and kids together and. Uh, families together and, and, and husbands who do the same thing. I mean, we're talking a whole range of socioeconomic opportunity. I was, I was lucky. What has he taught you? What has being a mother taught you? It's taught me to be more human, and it's taught me to be more, hopefully, I don't always succeed, but to be uh, more, um, you know, take into account a lot more around me and not just be so single-minded and single-focused, and to see things from a different perspective, because you have to. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been through a lot of child rearing classes. It might not show. I don't know what my son would say about this. But, <laughs> but reflective listening and all of that kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of useful, um, useful, uh, what's the right word? Habits or, or, sure. or traits to pick up from, from, from you know, development and, and, and child raising. There's a useful in your life, whole life as an adult. One of the audience questions that we got is from Carolyn Philippe, I believe, 92, from CIS. How has international journalism changed from when you first started in the industry to today? So I think it's changed in that um, it's just, it's, it's, it's not as focused on, certainly for Americans anyway, as it used to be. Um, I, I understand there's a big story in this country, big political story going on. Um, but I do think that you know you really do have to understand the world as well because borders are collapsing and evaporating with the internet, with our society as it is right mm -hmm. now. It's really a borderless society, no matter what politicians and demagogues want to say. It's more and more of a borderless Does society. Does it worry you that so much of the news cycle in America is is consumed with what's happening in Washington? You know, I can understand it. And I think that what's happened over the last four years is exhausting people, stressing people, depressing people, certain. Some, it's really energizing and, and impassion, impassioning um, and um, empowering. Um, but I do think that no matter whether you're on the empowered side of the spectrum or the exhausted side of the mm -hmm. spectrum, I really do think there needs to be a huge amount of effort to try and this is where political leadership matters, and it's also to an extent where media matters too, to try to, to find areas of, of understanding and of common ground yep. and commonality. Because this is just very poisonous mm. and exhausting for, for, for everybody. We have one minute left and we have to get you on a flight. You did the, a great interview with Playboy that everyone should read mm. if they haven't already. It's fantastic. I was naked. <laughs> And you talk about your sexy 60s. Oh. In all seriousness, my question is about this, third act, yeah. what you call your third act. Yeah. What are we going well, to see? Well, it was a pathetic attempt to make myself feel better when oh, I said come sexy on. 60s. Um, I think you look pretty great. Thank you. Yes, I mean um, that. And I'm feeling great. Yes. Yeah. Um, what is no, that just three think, look, for Christian? This is what I say. Um, I have been incredibly lucky at all stages of my life, right? Because I've managed to deal with all stages in a way that's, that's just, I've loved every stage. And I know how difficult it is for older women. I just know. I know the way people look at you or don't look at you. I know the way you're aged out of, of yeah. work, especially when you're on camera. Um, I know, you know, how society treats older women in a different way than they treat older men. So all I'm just trying to say is that uh, I, I try to use my example when I can and post things if I think is, you know, fun and empowering um, to say, you know what, it's just a number, seriously, guys, it's just a number. And the world has moved and DNA has progressed and, you know, health and exercise and all the rest of it and opportunities um, that it just doesn't matter anymore, you know. Yeah. And let's face it, Diane Sawyer and Barbara Walters were on the air when they were older than oh. I am, and they were brilliant, absolutely brilliant at what they did. They nailed it all the time. And so this, this unfairness about women and aging, I want to just try to, whatever I can do, to try to, Thank um, you. To try to empower that. women. Because 
certainly there's third and fourth act, without a doubt, thank without you. a doubt. Yeah. Christian, um, thank you. Before, before we finish the applause, someone, uh, a former member of the administration said to me the other day, of Which the Trump administration, administration oh. said to me the other day, CNN is a national treasure, and you are a national treasure, and I am grateful for you, and we all are. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Poppy. You're welcome. Thank you very much.